today I will start speaking about uh, the manufacturing of oligonucleotides. Um, I need that. Yeah, okay. So, what are we going to speak about in this uh, first uh, 30 minutes of uh, this workshop? We will be speaking about something very basic in oligonucleotide development. You have one oligonucleotide that has been selected through some research, and uh, you finally get your lead compound, the product that gives you the best gene knockdown inhibition of a protein synthesis, and you have to go through all the process of pharmacological testing, toxicological testing, and then if everything is going well, IND, phase one, phase two, phase three, and hopefully commercial synthesis. It's a long process, and it's something that will bring you from uh, buying 10 milligrams of an oligonucleotide from one of those oligo houses, and you receive a small tube with something in the tube, you don't know how it has been done. Um, sometimes we have an HPLC trace, and uh, you have to develop that into a process that is robust, that is efficient, and where you understand every aspect of the synthesis, purification, the impurities, and so on and so forth. Um, we don't have enough time in this first 30 minutes to address another important part of the process that is you have made your oligonucleotide, you have uh, one, two, three, ten pots containing total uh, five kilos of an, of an oligonucleotide, and you have to transform that into syringes, small vials that will be used in the clinic. That's the fill and finish process, but today we do not have time to address that. It's a very specialized part. We will just speak about the development of the synthesis, the oligonucleotide, the drug substance, the API manufacturing. Uh, Pascal, le compteur de temps ne fonctionne pas. Je suis bloqué à 10 minutes là. Donc je ne sais pas où j'en suis. Um, so, first, you have to realize that developing an oligonucleotide as an, APA, as an API is not more expensive than doing that for a small molecule or anything else. It's just a process that is very well understood, that has been done thousands of times for a lot of different molecules, and it's just a journey that you have to go on, and you can find people with a lot of experience in developing that. So it's not something absolutely, completely, terribly difficult. Developing an oligonucleotide can be expensive, depending on the kind of modifications you are adding into your oligonucleotides and uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, specifics that you introduce. So a lot of this will be decided by how you make the decisions during your research phase. First of all, you have to remember that modifications cost money. Some modifications are a lot more expensive than others. For some applications, you may want to attach some peg to your oligonucleotide. That is something that costs quite a lot of money. So if you don't absolutely need it, it's not necessary. Um, chemical modifications, DNA is 
definitely the cheapest. If you go to RNA, we have seen an incredible decrease in the cost of the amidites for introducing 2 prime methyl, 2 prime fluoro, uh, in, uh, or even 2 prime deox, 2 prime TBDMS that gives ribo modification. So those costs are more and more under control. Another point is that I don't think it's necessary to reinvent the wheel or to create something uh, extremely different from everything people have done before. Um, you can rely on companies, CMOs that have already pretty good process from the shelf and start building with that. And that's what we will try to discuss during the, this talk. Starting with something that is relatively well understood and building on that to refine the process. When you start your first mid-scale synthesis, let's say you want to get 50 grams, 100 grams of your oligonucleotide for uh, studies in animals, toxicological studies, it's not necessary to look for super high purity. You don't want to make your tox study with something that is 95, 96% pure. You want to have some impurities in your tox batch to analyze the potential toxic effects of those impurities and make sure that you rule out that this or that N minus one, N plus one, other uh, modified oligonucleotides has been tested in the tox studies and having data showing to the agencies that, yes, we have a little bit of this species, but it is not toxic, so it's not a problem. And also, especially today, in the, this situation where a limited number of CMOs with experience making large-scale oligonucleotides in GMP-compliant facilities is limited with a very high number of projects and a lot of oligonucleotides waiting to be synthesized. Don't be afraid of, at some point, maybe switching from one vendor to another one or qualifying a second vendor so you can plan your production in an easier way, with less pressure and less constraint. Uh, having two contractors at some point could be a big advantage. So now, okay, you have your oligonucleotide, you need this quantity, uh, you have several possibilities. And those choices will be made based on every company's situation. You can do it yourself. That means that you need to have a lab with synthesizers, you need chemists, you need people and equipment to purify the oligonucleotide, and you need to access to tests to characterize your oligonucleotide. Doing that for pharmacological studies, tox studies, it's not that difficult. You don't need to build a GMP compliant facility. If you want to continue to make your oligonucleotide by yourself for clinical trials, then it starts to be a little bit more complex because you need to build a quality management system that complies with GMP guidelines. You need a QA department, you need a lot of SOPs. So that's a real, a real big task. It needs quite some money. And in the early phase of your development, you have to ask yourself and you have to, to, to make a decision about is it worth to invest 
10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars in building all that when you will also need quite some millions for the phase one, a little bit more millions for the phase two, and so on and so forth. So what is the best possible use of your equity? Everybody has to make this decision. And there is no perfect answer. Then the second possibility is to rent, meaning you go to one of those CMOs making large scale synthesis, non-GMP and GMP, and you pay them to produce something using one of their generic methods. So basically you rent their equipment and their know-how and their IP to make your oligonucleotide and you get something. Third possibility is to buy the product and the process. So that means that before going to a CMO, you are working with someone else that could be your internal synthesis department, your internal analytical uh, chemistry laboratory, and you come with a certain process that you have already polished a little bit, your own analytical methods, and you provide all that to the CMO. That means that they are working with your process. And the advantage for the company developing oligonucleotides that way is that you keep some control on the IP covering this production. Means that if one at some point you want to change from one CMO to another one or you want to appoint a second vendor, you know a lot more about the process and it's a lot easier to make this transfer. Dealing with those CMOs implies that you, you have to understand how they are functioning and what is the main difference between a CMO and a sponsor. For the sponsor, the company who is developing a certain oligonucleotide, trying to, to transform that into a commercial therapeutic, this company wants to develop new medical product, medicine, and the goal is to gain some regulatory approval for selling the drug and to provide some return on investment to the people who have been investing in your company, putting money so you can develop those products. And the sponsor is trying to develop a platform of technology, different antisons, different siRNAs or aptamers or other type of oligonucleotides to create value and to provide a cure. That's the long-term goal. At the same time, the CMO is a company that has invested money and time, but time is money, to build a manufacturing facility, uh, a QC laboratory, an analytical method development, a quality management system, so they can manufacture and characterize API and drug products also to provide some returns to their investors. And they are developing processes adjusted to the different molecules that their clients are asking them to make. So they can get and build and develop some competitive advantage. Meaning that at some point, both models require investments and they have different expectations on the rate of return. So 
it's a little bit conflicting it's to some extent, but you have to work with that, and you have to develop an ability to handle that as nicely, as positively as possible, to build something that at the end is a win-win situation. What is the sponsor looking for? Sponsor is looking for something that is reliable. Having a process and some methods that are the best adapted to the product and that will provide again and again, uh, batch after batch, the right quality. And that's important, the right quality that is not always the best quality because you don't want to overpay, you don't want to develop an overkill process, but the right quality in the right amount and at the right time. Today, that's perhaps the most difficult part of the equation, to get your product at the right time. Needs some discussion, planning, and good relationship with your CMO if you're using a CMO. You also want security. Because if you plan some talk studies, you have animals that will be ready for something, you have planned different uh, experiments and you have told your investors, we will be ready with the IND by end of October and all of a sudden you get a phone call and you learn, oh, sorry, we cannot make your only good uh, date that was initially planned. We have to postpone everything by two months. That's not something easy to handle. So that also needs some very good connection, relationship, and dialogue with your CMO. Then you have the IP. You do not want to suddenly realize that the process that has been developed for you is using something, specific uh, sulfurization reagent, for instance, if you have phosphorothioates in your oligonucleotide or a detritylation method that is owned, that is patented by someone else. And that this someone else may eventually come and say, hey guys, you're doing this to make your therapeutic oligonucleotide, so let's discuss with our lawyers because you need to have a license for that. So, Pay attention when you start discussing with your CMOs that they have all necessary freedom to operate to avoid those problems. It is possible that if you're making your oligonucleotides in the United States that some people will tell you, oh, you know, in the US we have this safe harbor exception, meaning if you are using a patented technology, meaning you are infringing on a patent, provided you are doing that for clinical development, it's fine. Nobody can attack you for that. It's legal. Supreme Court decision, don't ask me from the top of my head the case number and the date, but it is something clear. It does not exist in that way in Europe, for instance. So you can infringe legally some patents because you are making clinical development. However, if you go that way and you arrive phase three, close to the NDA, and uh, those patents are still valid, and you want to start planning uh, the launch of your product, the pressure is coming pretty heavy, and the negotiation for those licenses can become a little bit more difficult. So planning all that ahead of time is also important. And then the cost is also extremely important. <laughs> Having said that, 
You have also to keep in mind that the cost of manufacturing your oligonucleotides will probably be a small part of the total cost compared to the cost of the clinical trials. If you want to develop an oligonucleotide for some cardiovascular application, and if the phase three clinical trial you have to develop, it's going to include, let's say, 2,500 patients, be aware that the budgets you are speaking about are in the hundreds of millions. I've seen some proposals for some specific clinical development phase three. 400, 450 million dollars. At that stage, your oligonucleotide will only be a small part of that. So it's not the biggest part of your budget. The CMO have other drivers. And for those who don't know, remember that I have been in charge of one of those CMOs for quite some years. So I've been living with that every day for several years. The main goal is, OK, we have been successful. We have signed this contract with company Z. We will make the oligonucleotide. Are we going to keep them for the second batch, the third batch, and so on and so forth? Are they going to stay with us up to the validation of the process? And is there a chance that we will keep them on board for commercial manufacturing. We are investing time and money. We have skilled chemists developing specific methods to improve the, the impurity profile, the yield, and so on and so forth. So we are inventing something. How to make sure that this is not something that will leak to competitors so they can improve without doing the same efforts. We have put so many millions to build those GMP suites. How are we going to maximize the value of this investment? Can we manage to make two, three, five, ten different oligonucleotides with more or less the same process so we increase our, the, the, to, to make our process more efficacious. That's also something that is important to get this return on investment for the, the, in the, the investors. How are we going to avoid contamination of our IP with sponsors license and make something that is at the end pretty difficult to control in terms of uh, uh, IP and freedom to operate. So those are the, the concerns of the CMO, besides making the client happy. Sometimes, because I'm on the other side of the table now, negotiating with CMOs for customers, it's not always obvious to feel that the CMO is so concerned about making customers happy. You have to remind them at the end of the day that if you are there, it's because I'm paying you. And so you can continue to develop your business. Again, it can be a little bit of a conflict, but try to build a win-win situation. It's for the best advantage of everybody. So. We can first conclude now that it's important to spend time to develop this network, to negotiate, to have very good, um, very good contacts with some key people in your CMOs to make sure everything is going smoothly. And you can leverage on, them, on that to, to develop your project. Realize that both parties have different positions and uh, try to build this portability that will 
allow you when you need it or when you have to, to move the projects from one place to another as easily as possible. Now a little bit more technicalities. You can do your oligonucleotides on a lot of different type of machines. Um, research, you have all those kind of uh, small synthesizers. Then you can move an, an oligo, an oligopilot uh, 100. Then you have the OP400. Then you have those big oligo processes. And good point, they're all using the same chemistry. But the design is different. The methods are a little bit different. You may have heard quite some time, amidites and solid supports are the most expensive raw material when you, you, well, sorry, when you synthesize an oligonucleotide. Well, we will see. Cost reduction of amidites and solid support will have a big linear effect on the cost of your API. That is not correct. Or only sometimes. So I have analyzed the cost of manufacturing of about 20 different oligonucleotides. It's pretty rough analysis because it includes DNA, RNA, siRNAs, uh, but it's an interesting view, I would say. Um, those campaigns have produced anything between 20 and 800 grams of oligonucleotide. And what you can see here is that those amidites represent only 22% of the total cost. So you can cut your amidite cost by two, you only reduce the cost of your oligos by 10%. Purification resin, it's not an insignificant part and then you have all that, these others. Because what is not always easy to figure out when you're making small scale oligonucleotides is that you will start using much larger filters for the ultrafiltration. It's not cheap. You will need buckets, you will need tubes, you will need a lot of different things, and you will need quite some water for the purification of your oligonucleotides, GMP, low bio burden, this is not tap water. It's pretty expensive and for large scale purification you need a lot of water. So this is something that contributes heavily. You have to deal with waste treatment when you produce 25,000 liters of organic wastes you don't send them down the sink. You have to pay someone to take care of that. And so all those things are 20, almost a little bit above one quarter of the total cost. And then you have the labor of the people making this oligonucleotide for you. So the price is a mix of all that. You have a lot of different steps during synthesis and purification, and all those can be addressed for improving the efficacy. And this is, I will conclude with that, an example of something one CMO, one of my client and myself have achieved. So we had two SI RNAs in this drug substance. So two SI RNAs means four strands. First, we decided to try to improve the process by changing the support. And we moved from CPG to one polymeric support. Then we changed the detritylation mix, trying to reduce a little bit the cost, but mostly to, do some, to use something that is that reduces as much as possible the risk of depurination during the synthesis. We also changed the 
oxidation mix to reduce the percentage of uh, PO in the PS and to, to improve the oxidation so we didn't have those uh, gap mer the If you don't oxidize correctly, you will remove the base during the detritilation uh, and so to, to, to limit the N minus one and minus two. We also worked a lot to fine tune the cleavage and the protections. And finally, we changed the purification resin and the method used to purify the oligo. Changing the resin allowed us to double the loading capacity of our column, meaning that we need two times less resin to purify the same quantity of oligonucleotide. Knowing that it's 12% of the total cost, it's also significant. And what you can see is that we have increased the, the full length product in the crude quite reasonably. The yield increased very significantly. And after purification, we didn't really push the, the purity too much, I would say. Uh, sorry, there is a, an, a mis, um, mistyping here. Obviously, it's not 1.6. And uh, most important, between the initial process and the new process, you can see that we have increased by 70 to 150 percent the grams of pure strength we got per millimole of synthesis. And so this is something that we achieved by modifying those parameters. Um, took about six weeks. And uh, I'm very happy to have worked with my ex-colleagues of Avicia in Cincinnati to achieve that. So it's possible to, to get those kind of yields. So in conclusion, it is possible to synthesize multi-kilo of oligonucleotides reproducibly. We can predict a lot of those N minus and other impurities. You can identify them with LCMS, and you can play with your methods to progressively reduce those impurities. Production capacity is expanding, and with today something like probably 160 different oligonucleotides at different stages of clinical development. Uh, it's nice that this production capacity is expanding. Um, it's a little bit slow, but hopefully they will come in activity uh, soon. And it is possible to develop processes with a pretty good yield, above five grams per millimole per strand, that contributes to reduce the cost of production of your oligonucleotides. And for this presentation, as for the other ones, I remind you that there is no question answer session. All the presenters, all the speakers will come back on the stage at the end of the workshop for a Q&A session. Thank you for your attention. And uh, we will now invite Paloma for the second presentation of today. Thank you very much.